first studying ethnomusicologist, mm -hmm. which I want to call you an ethnobotanist all the time. I don't know why when I talk about you. Oh, like completely different things. Um, but he's actually studied the science and the math of why sound heals and how sound heals, and also the in cultural aspects, religious aspects. And I'm not going to try to begin to explain any of that or his credentials that are like this long, um, because I'm sure after you hear speak like me, you're going to want to just hear more and more and more and find out about what he teaches and where else he's speaking. So I'm just going to let you take over, and you're all set with, with all of this. So with Without further ado, and not being here, can we can clap? Please, huge, grateful, thank you, welcome to Alexander Tanu. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here for this great cause with amazing musicians. Thank you very much, Tabitha, for the invitation. So, um, yes. Um, when Tabitha invited me, I, the first thing I, I asked when I'm about to give a talk, how much time do I have? And I said, 30 minutes, what can I say in 30 minutes? I need 30 days to talk about all these exciting things. So I'm going to be covering a wide variety of different uh, aspects. Um, uh, please remember that anything, every single slide, anything I'll be talking about, I can at least riff for half an hour just on one thing. It's incredibly complex material and, and very, very exciting. I come to all of this as a musician. I've been studying music since I was five and I spent 12 years at the university doing four different degrees in theory, composition, performance, and ethnomusicology. Ethnomusicology is a field that studies uh, and, and tries to understand human beings by studying culture through music. So yes, we do study music, but the aim is to understand human behavior and human culture. And um, all of the material that you'll be um, listening to and looking at is based on years of research, studies, and uh, field work in over 40 countries, different continents, studying um, ancient cultures, music, tribal cultures, and, and so on and so forth. I've had various interests uh, over the years. I've studied <clears throat> various musical styles, Western and non-Western, played various instruments. Uh, <clears throat> but the real learning started when I uh, uh, started working with people as a sound therapist. Um, that's what I do now. I do research on sound. And the approach that I take is a multidisciplinary approach. In, and I study sound through three different perspectives. The Western scientific, um, trying to understand human consciousness and the impact of sound on, on our consciousness and incorporating various things, not just music, but physics, the physics of sound, acoustics, neuroscience, biochemistry, and mathematics. And also another perspective, Eastern philosophical, how sound was used in holistic practices. The third one is um, shamanic societal beliefs. And also, I always like to attribute a lot of this knowledge to well over 8,000 people I work with in sound therapy, collecting material from them in, in feedback and experience sharing and really try to understand what happens when we listen to music, when we're impacted by sound. And I kept on following things um, and now I deal with certain areas when it comes to sound really and these are the things that I will be addressing succinctly but you'll get a good taste. So first I want to talk about the most important thing in sound. They basically what makes sound what it is. It's harmonic overtones. This is a field that studied very seriously by physicists, acousticians who are specialized in studying sound and sound behavior and also mathematicians. Musicians do know about them, but unfortunately they don't know about overtones as much as mathematicians and physicists. A lot of you probably know that most of what sound is is really mathematics when you go into the deep end of it. And what sound is, is math musical mathematical ratios that you're experiencing in an auditory way. So what are overtones? Um, when you pluck a string, the string vibrates as a whole, but at the same time it vibrates in divisions of two, divisions of three, 
4, 5 to infinity. And every time it vibrates, it gives you an overtone. What are these overtones? Well, sound, let's say you're listening to one note. That one note is actually a sum of many different frequencies. In the same way, when a painter tries to uh, paint the sky at this moment in time, specific colors, the painter would not reach for with just one color. We'd mix various colors, a little bit of gray, a little bit of orange, and blues, and white, and so on, to eventually give you the specific color of the sky at that moment in time. So it's many different shades of different colors mixed together to eventually give you one thing. But sound is various frequencies. Sound has two components. The fundamental frequency, let's say you're listening to a note uh, played on violin or, or clarinet. That note is actually, what you're hearing is the fundamental frequency. But there are many different frequencies above from that, that we call overtones, harmonics, sometimes harmonic overtones. These terms are used interchangeably. Sometimes they shouldn't because are, there is a difference between harmonic overtones and anharmonic overtones. So the reason why these uh, overtones are in the sound is to give you the tone color, the timbre. Sound has a color, which allows to differentiate my voice from Tabitha's voice, from, uh, let's say, the sound of a clarinet, a C played on a clarinet compared to a C played on an oboe, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. What's responsible for that are the overtones. I'm going to talk a little deeper about this. So basically here, this is the string vibrating as a whole. You get the fundamental frequency. And at the same time, it vibrates in divisions of two. This here, there's a knot where the string doesn't really vibrate. This is where you get the first overtone. And as it vibrates in divisions of three, you get two overtones right there, the same actually. If you're interested in notes, the, let's say the vibrating open string is C, that's the fundamental frequency. This note right here will give you the first overtone, an octave higher C, for those of you who don't know music, is eight notes apart. And the next overtone will be G, a fifth higher from this C, and another C right there and there, which would be two octaves higher from the fundamental, so on and so forth. And these intervals, starting with an octave, and then a fifth, a fourth, they go on to infinity. So I'm, I'm drawing attention here to mathematics for a good reason, because we've seen to what extent intelligence manifests in mathematics. Uh, in, in nature, fractal geometry, Fibonacci series, phi and pi, harmonic overtone is an essential part. And many of the ancient scholars <laughs> were deeply interested in aspect. Pythagoras is one of them, who was, of course, known as the father of geometry, but not only that, he very deeply explored the esoteric side of sound, and it can get really, really weird <laughs> and awesome. I mean, yes. even if you're used to weird, you, it'll be weird. <laughs> Trust me, I, I love weird and, <laughs> and I'm comfortable with it, but I'm often weirded out in the most fantastic way. It's just weird. So he was also interested in dimensions of consciousness and sacred geometry. So this aspect, unfortunately, is foreign to us, but I'm, we're all really happy to see that there is a big renaissance of interest in it. So uh, <clears throat> it gets more complicated. Harmonic overtone series, this is the first 20 partials. This is the fundamental frequency. Don't worry about the notes if you can't read notation. You have the letters indicated there. So this is the fundamental frequency C, and this is the octave higher C, and then G and go on, goes on to infinity. You can see how the intervals shrink. This is your octave, and then a fifth, a fourth, and then a major third, minor third, and goes on smaller and smaller and smaller intervals and never stop. Mm. So, what a tone color is, is a culmination of the sum of these frequencies to what level or of strength or weakness these frequencies are found that would eventually give you what we call tone color or tan, again, which would allow you to differentiate one instrument from another. And, and these harmonic overtones are found everywhere. Most of the time we don't hear them because the fundamental frequency is so pr pronounced it overshadows the harmonic overtones. We start to hear them when we play, interestingly enough, instruments used in sound healing, ancient and contemporary. 
um, gongs and lane singing bowls, the jiridu, bells, discs, diaphonic singing, overtone singing, um, uh, Jews harp, and, and so on. Now, the level of complexity that I wanted to address a little bit is these fluctuating integer numbers, plus and minus. So something happened to our music in the West that I considered a, a sheer castration. That's called the equal temperament. Early talk started in the late 1500s, but it took a couple of centuries for it to be implemented little by little and eventually became standardized system. What is the equal temperament? So the Western octave is equal to 12 half steps. And the half step is the distance between the white and the adjacent black key on the piano. Uh, C to C sharp, C sharp to D, and so on. These half steps were not quantized before the equal temperament. They had different mathematics. The octave is equal to 1200 cents. A cent is a logarithmic unit for measurement that's used by physicists. So that makes the half step 100 cents in the equal temperament. So on a equal tempered keyboard, which all keyboards, pianos nowadays are equal tempered, that means they're divided into 12 equidistant half steps, equal half steps even to the cent. So if you were to test the tuning of the overtones with an equal tempered keyboard, you get these fluctuating cents. That means this G right here is going to be plus two cents higher. Hmm. Most people won't hear that nuance because, you know, it's two percent of a half step. It's very, very minimal. And this is minus 14. This is plus two cents <coughs> again. And this is minus 31 cents for the musicians. This is where the blue note comes from. The blue note, which is not only found in, in blues, rock, and jazz, but in every musical culture. A blue note is a note flattened on purpose. We don't know why it resonates with us. It hits the right chord, the right feeling. That's, I think, because this harmonic overtone series is encoded in us. It's the blueprint from which we come up with all of the modes, all of the scales, all the harmonic um, systems that, that are found in different uh, countries. And keep in mind that not all cultures have 12 half steps in their octave. The Indian octave is divided into 22 tones. Uh, the Turkish and Persian octave is divided into 24 tones. Um, no, uh, yeah, I mean, Arabic and, and Persian. The Turkish octave is divided into 53 tones. Yeah. So, 12 half steps. Huh. It's a jib. <laughs> so, Basically, notice that all of the notes fluctuate and they have different integer numbers except for the fundamental frequency and every time it repeats in the harmonic series. So all of them are considered out of tune to us. Are they really out of tune? No, we are out of tune because the music that we use, the equal temperate scale, made us use a completely different mathematics than what nature gave us. The ancient musical culture is still continuing to this day. Indian, classical music, Turkish, Arabic, Persian, Central Asian, North African, pro probably all other non-Western cultures that have not been heavily impacted by the Western conservatory system. Deal with non equal <coughs> temperament. And this is why you have uh, transcendental states, um, altered states of consciousness that are achieved through judicious listening just listening, no plants involved, no sacraments, pure listening. Now, I'm not demeaning music in the West, it's still powerful, but we're missing out a lot on many, many things. So just imagine how powerful it can be. So, I'm going to play some examples. Um, what you're about to hear and see here is a visual depiction of what it the sound of a Himalayan singing bowl looks like. So here we have two channels, left channel, right channel. At first you're going to hear the entire spectrum of the overtones. Every horizontal line is one overtone. And second you'll hear the individual overtones played one at a time and moving on left and right channel together. And at the end you'll hear all of them together. Here I'm using a spectrum uh, a software that gives you the spectrum of what sound looks like, which is really, really helpful to understand these difficult concepts. So here we go. 
can I raise the volume a bit more, please? I tested it earlier and it was perfectly fine. So let me talk about overtones as Brendan is, is fixing the issue. Um, oh, children. So what's interesting, what I realized in my fieldwork, that human beings in all continents have always constructed instruments, um, even when they didn't deal with metallurgy, with metals. The instruments I mentioned, gongs and bowls and discs and, and bells, uh, are made of uh, an alloy of different metals, usually copper and tin, which gives you bell quality bronze. If you hear Himalayan singing bowls, seven metals, said it's not really seven metals. There are two primary metals and one percent of impurities of five to six metals. That's more accurate. Seventy-seven to eighty percent copper and twenty to twenty-two percent tin, and one percent mixture of gold. I mean, as impurities, gold, silver, lead, uh, um, zinc, and, and, and so on. But what's fascinating is that in, in, in uh, sub-Saharan African um, cultures, um, people built instruments from plant material and still found a way to deal with overtones, like on a jill, which is a, a mallet instrument made from wood, balafon in Mali. They would amplify these um, uh, wooden bars by putting um, calabash or, or gourd underneath that would match that specific frequency and would punch three holes on the side and put flattened spider eggs to bring out the buzzing, the amplification and the buzzing so you get the overtones in the buzzing. Yeah. Same thing in the mbira and, and uh, the, the African harp, this is where the harp comes from, from Africa. The bray system, the buzzing, also would bring out overtones. So something guides us. It guides us when it comes to exploring, building instruments. It's as if we know where um, the truth is. As if there is a compass within us that guides us. And harmonic overtones are always sought after. Why? Because they induce altered states of consciousness. They temper with the way we perceive the world. They take us to altered states. And I've measured that using. Um, electroencephalography and um, it, it's it's quite fascinating and I also um, later I'll show you some um, let's give it a try now Brenda okay
that's an example of what's in sound. <laughs> mm. Okay? Now, so I'm going to show you, this is a 38, 38 symphonic gong. All of these lines, every single line is a harmonic. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, using the software, you'll be able to play each one by one or a combination of two or three or you select or play all of them. So, of course, the sound of a gong sounds like... show you Shruti box, which has a sound similar to the harmonium. There are tiny reeds inside that vibrates, and this is an instrument that's used in, in chanting and vocalization. And this is what you get when you play the low C on it. Every horizontal is a harmonic. And the sound, for those of you who are not familiar with this instrument, So you can hear a few overtones in it as, as you're hearing the sound, but you certainly don't hear all of this. So does the body respond to the sound, to the overtones, when we don't hear them? Yes, it does. The brain does. And you'll see later on what brainwave cycles and the, and the electrical activity look like in the brain. It's really fascinating. This is a G, okay? So the G fifth higher from C, and the sound is... And this is C and G together. They're superimposed and, and the sound would be. And by the way, the, the fifth is the most powerful interval, the distance between C and G, but you can also go D to A and, and so on. Perfect fifth, that's what this is called. It's also the power chord on guitar. You get just two strings or sometimes three strings. This is what the sound of a didgeridoo looks like with some pauses or some, you know, how I was playing it but I was doing breaks just to see the separation. So again, every horizontal line is a harmonic. And this is a native Indian flute descending with little tiny trills in between. Again, a lot of harmonics. And this is the classical transverse flute, the silver flute that we all know. And notice how much less harmonics there are. Like a clearly depicted. And this is what my air conditioner looks like. <laughs> Again, they're everywhere. And a vacuum cleaner, for example. Every, every sound has, every, uh, any item that has an engine, basically has overtones. So, <clears throat> moving on, another thing that I studied a lot is the concept of ethos. The ethos is, the, is an, an ancient Greek word that's still used nowadays. It's a distinguishing character, personality, or sentiment of a mode or a scale. For example, when, you, when we listen to a piece of music written in a major key, most people will feel, oh, it sounds happy, easygoing, lighthearted, versus minor, which sounds a romantic, sad, lamenting, there's a sense of yearning, spooky to some, depending on how the minor scale is composed. So when you listen to Indian classical music, Turkish, Arabic, Persian, all these uh, modal musical cultures, you're actually, the, the best way to listen to it is to tap into the ethos. In Indian music, they're called bhava and rasa. And basically losing yourself, having an awareness of the mind as you're listening, not thinking, but trying to feel the emotions that this specific rag or raga is inducing into you and allowing you yourself to, to be moved by the different intervals. But we, when we listen to two notes played simultaneously, the two notes are not as important as much as the interval between the two notes. This is where the ratio is. So, when an Indian classical music the musician is playing a sitar or sarod or a bansuri or any instrument, you're supposed to just surrender. And yes, there is some prerequisite knowledge, some, some awareness of how to listen to that raga and really let go, not 
pursue any discursive thinking, but to feel what are the probabilities of what one can do, how one can paint emotions. And this is where artistry comes in improvising, but more like extemporizing a composition, playing a composition on the spot, based on the way the musician is feeling at that moment in time. So, um, most ancient cultures' music are considered modal music. The difference between mode and scale is very minimal. They both have a set of tones ascending and descending, but when you ask a Western musician to play a B-flat minor scale or G major scale, the musician is going to play it in an ascending and descending way. When you ask a musician from a different uh, musical culture, non-Western, to play or sing you a mode, they don't play it up and down or sing it up and down. They sing you a little fragment, an extemporized fragment, for you to feel what that mode feels like. They're not so concerned with the individual notes in succession, ascending and descending. They're interested in what kind of emotions one can paint with these notes. So that's the big difference. And I can talk for another five hours about this concept, but I'm going to stop here because there are many other things. But it's incredibly exciting and revealing, okay? And how much emotions can be encompassed in music. Even songs without lyrics could be just vocalese using the voice but without specific lyrics. But also lyrics, poetry, uh, can have an ethos as well. So let alone when they combine. And this is a concept that, that was used a lot in uh, shamanic societies. The ikaros, for example, in ayahuasca ceremonies, are all based on the ethos. Mm -hmm. And it's really fascinating what they do to the limbic system and how they vibrate person to different levels of emotion. So here are some um, uh, uh, snapshots of complete studies that I've done with um, EEG. Uh, before I do this, I want to talk a bit about brainwave cycles. Brainwave cycles are almost like the gears, the five gears that we have in our brain, uh, where a uh, different level of electricity is happening, depending on what brainwave cycles we are in. The delta, which is, you can see it here, 0 0.1 to 4 hertz, which is a deep sleep, not dreaming, sleep uh, state, so the brain is operating on very low hertz cycles per second. If you're meditating or drowsy, drifting, that's the theta state, 4 to 8 hertz. Alpha state, 8 to 13, awake but mentally relaxed. Beta state, 12 to 30 hertz. Gamma state, 30 to 100, which is a state of learning of creativity. So this is my subject's baseline brain. This is the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere. This is time, it's about uh, six seconds. So the activity start right here and they move up, it's three dimensional. Uh, the blue is no electrical activity, green is a little more electrical activity. And then you get red and yellow and white. These are the highest peaks. And the hertz are on the bottom here, zero, 20 hertz, 60, 90, 120 and so on. So this is my subject laying down, wearing a mask. Nothing is being played. But there's a lot of mental activity. All these spikes here, they're mental activity, they're thoughts. And all the th these activities are measured using microvolts. This is zero microvolt, 10 microvolt. The microvolt is approximately one millionth of a volt. Okay. We do, our brain works on electricity and chemicals. I play a large gong and the activity is flattened. Once again, look at the difference. This is after just two, oops, after two minutes of playing. To a neuroscientist, the person is sleeping. But no, she wasn't sleeping. This is open fifth. Again, powerful interval using tuning forks. Quiets the mind quite a lot. Small Japanese bell, loud dynamics, and notice the difference between loud dynamics and soft dynamics. This. Now this eruption here is not discursive thinking, it's not the monkey mind. This is the limbic system being activated, which is our emotions. So again, this is the function of music, is resetting the emotions, allowing the person to revitalize the capacity of the heart, to 
reignite this emotional capacity that we can feel through sound. Shruti box also quiets the mind. The frame drum. What's important here, so frame drum, all uh, instruments, percussion instruments made out of skin can produce overtones as well. It's not the very pronounced spectrum, but you can hear overtones. But what's fascinating here is the synchrony, the similarity between the left and right hemisphere. This is why rhythms and overtones are important in, in, uh, in going in trance, in drum circles, for example. Hmm? So, another thing that I wanted to mention is that in all of the ancient musical cultures that I studied, there were always two very strong parameters. One, the rhythmic mode and the melodic mode. The rhythmic mode is, if you want, the, uh, the repetitive rhythmic structure that it can be used and it can change, like they call called tala in, in Indian music. The tala, when they're being played, they don't stay the same, they develop. In uh, Arabic classical music, in Turkish, they call it ikahat. They can have two beats per cycle. I've seen up to 128 beats per cycle. Some of them have a different tone color than another, and some beats are not sounding. But when musicians play them, they play them in a heterorhythmic hetero way, which means playing, allowing you to feel the rhythmic mode, but elaborating on it, while you're still feeling the rhythmic mode, but they do a lot of ornamentation. The melodic mode is when you have a raga or makam in Arabic music, which is the scale. And um, a lot of these scales in non-Western music, in these musical cultures I mentioned, they have a lot of half flats and half sharps. The distance between C and D, which in West we call major second, which we have two half steps, in Turkish music, you have nine steps. That's how many new things can be. Why? Where do they come from? Well, these microtonalities that we find come from the complexity of the harmonic series. So, ancient musical culture dealt on a deeper level with divisions that are part of sound as they're found in the blueprint of sound that nature gave us, which is the harmonic overtone series. And the complexity happens a lot in how the rhythmic mode and the melodic mode play together, fit together. It's really complex. Also, olfactory stimuli can um, cause changes. Palo Santo is sacred wood, literally. It comes from the Amazon and it's used a lot in shamanic ceremonies. So, uh, it's off the chart, literally. So that's the limbic system, again. And I also measured what orange blossom water does. Also a lot of emotions. So, I collected a lot of data and, and used my training to really better understand it, my ethnomusicological training as well. Studied different musical systems, I had to study languages and live with people and learn to play their music. And, and this is something that started emerging after graduate school. The most important thing I learned about sound is after 12 years of higher education, unfortunately. So I, I felt that, my God, this knowledge is not just for me. I have to transmit this to people. So I started lecturing uh, about it and teaching it to other people. But I wanted to create a setting in which I can share this knowledge with people by giving them a bit of information in the beginning of the experience and giving them the direct experience immediately after. The direct experience is always the most important part. But what I notice is that there is some prerequisite knowledge that enhances the person's awareness to allow the person who is having this experience, the sound meditation, what I call, to have an empowering experience that can change their mindset as to what sound can do. And this Sound uh, meditation setting that I have is an integrated experience which combines attention to mindset or intention, the setting, meditation, breathing exercises, diaphragmatic breathing exercises, visualization and guided visualization, verbal guidance that I use to bring awareness, what may be happening inside the person or in the music, toning and vocalization, working with overtone emitting instruments, and judicious and equanimous listening. 
I demonstrate and explain to people to how to use sound um, as a tool to stop the discursive thinking, the monkey mind, to be able to get to a point where they lose completely the sense of self and to become part of that dimension. Literally, I mean, sound is a dimension. Once you start to zero in on it and understand the mechanics of it and what sound really is, it's literally a dimension that would be outside of space and time and the world of material. And this is what a lot of people experience in it, even in the West, when they go into deep trance, when, they, when they're dancing or when they're listening. But uh, there has to be judicious listening. One cannot be thinking about various things as one is listening or having conversation. The impact can be minimal, but we don't fully go there. We need to fully pay attention to really be part of that dimension and be fully impacted by sound. <coughs> so um, these are some of the main benefits that I've observed after having collected well over a thousand of uh, some of the richest and longest emails I've ever received since the beginning of email. <laughs> uh, the longest one is 19 pages, single spaced, incredibly articulated, uh, well articulated. And um, so I've received over a thousand of them. Quieting the mind is one. Um, people told me that um, they're able to disengage their undesirable habitual patterns. Um, they felt empowered. Few people quit antidepressants, um, diminishing anxiety and panic attacks, accessing and releasing traumas, to bring the self into a state of inner peace and calmness, to establish a state of resonance and attunement with the self, enhancing one's state of presence and self-awareness, to exercise a state of equanimity and no judgment, to fine-tune self-observation, increasing self-confidence and attention, enhancing one's ability to listen, focus and gaining attention to a greater level of details, Improving dynamics between couples, dealing with insomnia, triggering and enhancing one's ability to dream. And um, some other um, benefits on the mental and emotional levels. What I found that sound does is, sound enhances our self-awareness, it facilitates connecting with the higher self, it promotes self-observation and self-worth, and it increases the state of personal resonance. It brings awareness to the inner process of the mind, the habitual patterns, the good and the bad, discursive thinking, the judgment, the filters through which we experience the inner and the outer worlds and realities. It promotes and facilitates the process of inner transformation. It is a tool for self-exploration, consciousness expanding, self-maintenance, self-therapy and self-healing. It is a great tool for self-inquiry. It promotes acting with pure intentions and it facilitates a heightened state of awareness and presence. It promotes an increased state of empathy, compassion and love toward the self and others. It brings awareness to how much the inner reality is connected to and uh, impacts the outer reality. I'm very interested in the concept of reality, what reality is and where reality is. This is something that uh, contemporary physics is, is shedding a lot of light. Um, Reality is a biocentric mechanism, is, is an inner process in the same way we dream. When we dream, we're not aware that in a few hours we're going to wake up to consensual reality. That is the only reality that we know. And when we wake up, you know, there's a little confusion for five, ten seconds and then we forget the dream. It seems like, and it's coming from many different sources, the ancients have been talking about this and now physics and science is proving that that means that we're kind of dreaming all of this in such a real way that we call it reality. So, techniques to keep your awareness on the sound, this is very important. So I, my, my interest is to empower people in the experience. Um, I, you know, I, I don't call myself a healer, uh, unless we all agree that a healer helps people heal themselves. That's honestly what I, learned about healing, having worked a lot on my own healing over many, many years, and I still continue, and learning about how my clients experience healing. So, the most important thing is to empower people, to give them the tools, and, and communicate, transmit to them what are some of the best ways that they can use these tools while we discover new ways. And I learned from them tremendously, okay? So, 
But part of using sound as a tool to stop the discursive thinking, it's very, very hard. To, those of you who have been meditating know to what level it, it, it can be hard to really turn off of the mind. But sound can allow us to make it much easier. Judiciously listen to the overtones, become aware of the space between the overtones, explore the different registers of these over the register of these overtones, observe the varying modulation. That's the technical word, word, which is the beat, the wobble, the wavering of the overtones, the pulsating effect, speed of different overtones. Notice their varying, dynam uh, their varying dynamics, uh, how soft and loud. Visualize opening yourself to the sound and merge with it. Contemplate the shifting energy of the overall sound and of the overtones. Allow yourself to be completely engrossed in the sound to an extent where anything outside of that which you're observing would cease to exist. This is where you become the event and there's no more awareness of the observer. Going deep into the sound until you reach time stopping ecstasy. So these are the commonly used instruments in sound therapy or sound healing. This is just a few of them. Gongs, the voice, singing bowls, Himalayan or crystal. Bells, metallic discs, chimes, reed instruments, shruti bars, harmonium, so on. Uh, didgeridoo, tuning forks, frame drums, shakers, rattle, the you know, plant material, the tampura. This the instrument, this instrument, which is the tall standing four string metal string instrument that's played on open string. This is the most important instrument in Indian classical performance. That's usually played by a student to accompany a vocalist. Uh, violinist, uh, sarod player, bansuri, sitar, whatever you want. And it gives the open strings, and they take great care in tuning these open strings to the most impeccable level. Why? Because as they resonate, they create buzzing. The buzzing comes from a little thread that's put between the string and the bridge that would cause the rattling, the buzzing. And it's very important for the performer to listen to the overtones as they're exploring the possibility of the raga. Why? Because this is where the shrutis are. This is where they can tune their intervals to a level where they fit the blueprint, which is the harmonic overtone. And this is why that music is magical, that it takes many, many years to really learn how to listen to it in the most uh, just way. So what I also promote, and this is very important, is phenomenological and ontological study of, of an experience. Uh, phenomenology and ontology are both branches in philosophy. Phenomenology is the study of the structures of experience and consciousness. It is primarily concerned with the systematic reflection on and study of the structures of consciousness me, and the phenomena that appears in acts of consciousness. Uh, some prominent phenomenologists, Heidegger, Hegel, Berlok, Morty, Sartre, and so on. Ontology is the philosophical study of the nature of being, becoming, existence, or reality, as well as the basic categories of being and their relations. So we all know that direct experience is the most important thing for us, right? Yeah. But there are many ways to experience something based on how much can we pay attention? How much can we quiet the mind? How much can we extrapolate things out of that one experience? And this is an ancient uh, study, part of philosophy, to focus on that and discuss because you know the earliest studies about consciousness came out of philosophy, and then physics, you know, carried on the torch. And in contemporary science. All sciences in all fields, I think we should pay attention to what uh, physicists, especially theoretical physicists, 